patterns in S3 data access, protecting and enhancing access to data banks, lakes, and bases with Josh Schneider. I'll hand it over. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Houston. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. Uh, my talk could just be set, described as how to provide really, really granular access to S3. So to give you a little bit of an idea about myself, I am an infrastructure engineer who became a database engineer, who became a database automation engineer. Now I'm a security engineer. And I think you'll find that thread woven into this talk as well. So let's start off with a, you know, giving you a little bit of an overview. Uh, we're going we're gonna to discuss how requests in AWS are signed. I think we'll, we'll come ac across a couple surprises along the way. We'll introduce a problem of data that is a little too complex to model with existing authorization tools. We will discuss available solutions, some of the ones that are, are pretty well known. And then we'll discuss uh, one solution based on just-in-time access that's rather less known and I think uh, deserves, deserves to be considered once all the other solutions are exhausted. So before I go any further, I really want to introduce this other talk. Um, it was given at reInvent last year, and it covers a lot of the same ground in more detail and with more expertise, because Becky Weiss is very knowledgeable in this area. Uh, and I recommend absolutely go watch that talk. If you're, before you implement anything for my talk, if you're, if you're really interested in my talk, go watch hers first. Make sure that, uh, that you, you understand all the concepts really well. Because if you're not doing your homework in this area, then you're probably going to going to overcomplicate your solution. Um, and this is an area where it actually really pays to to go with the simplest solution that works for your use case. So before we go any further, we're going to get get a little bit of an overview of how uh, requests in AWS are signed. We'll start with something that might be a little familiar. Um, and uh, to 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 start off, let's motivate what this problem might, might look like as, as it gets more complex. So I really love Google Photos, but Google doesn't have the best reputation for keeping their products online. I'm worried Google Photos might be the next thing that, to sunset. And I'm thinking I might open up a competitor because I might be a better steward of, of, of this sort of uh, service than Google will. Um, and it's got these requirements. It's, it's literally the same requirements as Google Photos. We've got millions of users, billions of photos. The photos get shared in, in various ways. And those grants can be granted and revoked over time. And when we look at this, many, many people will say, OK, that's a natural use for signed URLs. So I've put a nice little signed URL up on the screen. It's 1,670 bytes. It is marching off the bottom of the screen. It's actually already expired, thank goodness. Um, I don't want any of you actually using the signed URL. Uh, but uh, yeah, before we go any further, actually, raise your hands if you've used signed URLs. All right, good number. Uh, if I tell you that the AWS console, when you press the download button for S3, also uses a signed URL, is there, do I get any more hands? All right, yeah. Um, so signed URLs are pretty useful. We can, we'll start to ask, OK, well, why did the console decide to go with this, this choice? Um, and that'll, that'll start to answer some questions about how S3 can be accessed in general. So you know, moving into theory, security theory from the 1970s, there's this concept of ca capability-based security. Um, and it was, it was invented a long, long time ago, um, at least from my perspective. Uh, and the idea was that the operating system would enforce some, uh, some authority that, that has been granted to, to another process. Maybe I have the ability to open a file, but, I, but after I've opened the file, I pass the capability to read from the file down somewhere else. And Wikipedia actually gives, I think, I think the best, most succinct definition. It's a communicable, unforgeable token of authority. In S3, that means this cryptographically authenticated signed URL that we saw a moment ago. Um, in the 1970s, they didn't use cryptography. They just used the operating system. But uh, it's, it's quite useful, because you can, you can use, a, use an authority that exists in one place and grant that capability to some, to some other area of your application. In the case of a signed URL, maybe for my photo sharing app, it would be a user's browser. But there's kind of one big problem with, with signed URLs, which is that they're URLs. They're not meant for use with an API-based client. So we'll need to figure out some way to bridge that gap. Now, this is a uh, reenactment or a reconstruction of what, what a security engineer's face looks like 
when I said that I wanted to have capabilities moving throughout my network to access my S3 bucket. Uh, they were like, okay, that sounds really dangerous. Um, but uh, then again, you know, the whole point of these capabilities is to move, between, move through a network. And uh, I, I, think, I think the docs actually a little overstated it. And I think somebody agreed with me because in, in late September, these, the AWS docs, which used to, used to include this big red warning, uh, had that warning removed. The warning used to say that uh, it was just as dangerous using, using signed URLs as it was sending your IAM credentials over the network. That was clearly untrue. And uh, now that box has just gone entirely. Uh, it is a little bit ancillary to the point of this talk. But, you know, if, if you're trying to, to talk to a person who's making the scream face, um, there are ways to make signed URLs safer. Uh, we d we've discussed uh, data perimeters in this room a little bit earlier. Uh, the IP, IP binding and source VPC binding that, that many data perimeters use would be effective here. Uh, I also have a solution based on cookie binding that I, I built as a little toy, toy solution here. Um, there, so there are ways to do it, but, but in, in general, you have to get a little bit comfortable with the idea that the thing with the authority to do something is going to grant that authority somewhere else in the network. And here's the big idea. The big idea of the talk, the thing that I'd like to take away from this talk, is that every single request in AWS is a portable capability. When I make a request to DynamoDB, when I make a request to EC2, when I go off and talk to um, any other service, KMS, um, I am building up a signed request that I can send to KMS, in that example, or I can send anywhere else. I could send it to a friend. I could send it to a loved one. Um, for the period of time that that request is valid, which is, is 15 minutes, they will have the capability to do whatever I was going to do against that AWS service. So that, um, and that, that is like, I've, I've found uh, zero exceptions. And they, I, I guess the, 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 the reason I've found zero exceptions is because every API-based request in AWS uses SIGV4. Um, so I guess actually the, the exceptions would be like RDS, where you've already logged into RDS and you're making subsequent requests over an open TCP connection. Um, but you know, every API-based request in AWS is going to use SIGV4, and every SIGV4 request is a portable capability. With that in mind, let's look a little bit behind the curtain at how AWS request signing works. Uh, I want to warn you that this slide is oversimplified to the point of incorrectness in at least three different ways. And if you come at me over, over exactly how it's incorrect, you will have lost the point of the slide. Uh, what goes on when you, when you make a request to AWS is you, you come up with your request. Um, and you put that request into a canonical form. In, AWS, in, in the documentation, it's called a string to sign. What you do is you append your string to sign on to your secret access key, which is known only to you. You hash them together. That, that resulting hash can only be produced by someone who has your string to sign. So then you send off the hash plus your request to AWS. They do the same canonicalization operation on their side, uh, do the same hashing operation um, with, with the, the secret access key that is known to them. Um, and if they're equal, they go, OK, you know, this is an authenticated request. It, it looks like this person's asking us to do this thing. They move on to the next step of, oh, well, should they actually be allowed to do that thing? If they're not equal, AWS goes, no way. Here's your 403. Uh, nice little signature does not match. It's actually quite nice. They, they provide you a uh, description of everything that they did to, to determine that you got it wrong. Um, but it still feels like a slap in the face when you, get it wrong, when you mess it up. Uh, for the actual correct version of this, you can go watch Eric Brandwine's talk. It's a, it's a good one. It discusses some really cool security measures that they do to, to ensure that regions are isolated. Um, you can also read the docs. It doesn't describe as much of the why, but it does describe the how. There's also, uh, you know, you're, you take your favorite AWS SDK and you start reading the code, and you'll understand it pretty quick. So if you're a non-AWS user, I don't, I don't know how many non-AWS users we have in the room, but if you're like, okay, is this relevant to me at all, or is Josh just, am I going to waste 40 minutes listening to Josh talk about this? The answer is that many cloud object stores use the same SIGV4 authentication because they're emulating AWS's approach. And so if you're using any of these, uh, you can probably apply some of the same ideas in this talk to, the, to whatever your cloud is. 
So now we can get back to the problem at hand. We, you recall we were talking about that photo sharing app, and it has this complex pattern of data authorization that we need to, you know, we need to cope with somehow. So back with the photo sharing sh service, I have bolded a couple, a couple areas. Uh, one of them is that there are millions of users. And the idea here is because there's so many users, I'm not going to be able to build an IAM role for any one of them. I'm not, I, I'm, I have to deal with them in some way that is independent of the IAM system. Well, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the, in the next, next couple slides. Uh, next couple of issues is um, these, these one-to-many relationships. So figuring out whether a given user should have access to a given photo because they're being shared between users is non-trivial. It's not like I can say, oh, well, you know, these photos are owned by Josh, and I'll just show Josh only his own photos, because the idea is that there should be many other photos available to me as a user of this service. So notice that I didn't say a couple things. I didn't say it was complex because there is a lot of data. We could have billions, trillions of photos. That's not a problem. If they're all being, they're all, they all have the same access policy associated with them, I can, I can deal with that just fine. Um, and like, if, I, if I'm, for instance, just trying to show, show photos back to the person who originally uploaded them, that's a one-to-one -one authorization relationship. So I don't really have a problem there either. But we start to think about complex pattern data when there's too many, too many users to represent an IAM, too many relationships to represent an IAM, and I, I, IAM can't possibly know about them. So uh, the AWS IAM service lives in US East 1, and it's uh, designed as a control plane service. It's not designed for any frequent updates. It's not designed to provide anything fast. So the problem is when we, when, when we have policies change fast, like let's say I have an uh, album that is shared uh, that, that, uh, that contains a couple thousand photos and somebody adds or removes a uh, shared user with that album. Uh, that might be a couple thousand writes against the database. IAM is not going to be capable of accepting a couple thousand writes for any one user-generated user transaction from my app. Like, I, I just wouldn't want to do it that way. Now we can see, you know, I, I promised we would discuss data lakes. Now we can see some of the similarities with data lakes. In both cases, we've got uh, jobs th flowing through the system. Um, and in, bo in, in both cases, we have some mo mode of authentication that is not IAM. So in, in a photo sharing app, it's going to be like my user's HTTP cookie because they're logged in. In my data lake, it's going to be maybe an internally assigned JOT or an internally assigned X509 certificate that they present when they're, when they're asking for data uh, from my data lake. Um, we can also see that they're, they're operating arbitrary code in either place. Um, in my data lake, that's probably going to be like some data lake framework that we partially control because people might want to install plugins into their data lake framework or, or do all sorts of things that provide them flexibility in order to manage and massage their data in the most appropriate means. Um, and in, you know, in the photo sharing app, it's going to be us end users with, with their own browsers that we, we have no control over, over what code they're going to run or what API requests they're going to, going to issue. So similarities. Uh, we, the other big similarity I'd like to, to really point out is that we can't reshape the data. I can't go dictate what the storage layer is going to look like, probably in either situation. And I also can't uh, qu quickly enough model, model any of this stuff using AWS IAM. Uh, so that, that I think, uh, the, that combination of too many things operating too fast defines the complex pattern data problem. So this comes to, OK, how do we secure the data lake? And we've got the common solutions that I'd like to go through as a way of motivating why we can't, like, why we can't use each one of them, and to give you off-ramps where you can say, OK, actually, that one is going to work for me. Why don't I take that, that approach rather than going for the more complex approach? And this is where the talk by Becky Weiss uh, comes in really handy, why I, I, I really strongly recommend going and watching it, because she covers all but one of the, the approaches that I wanted to take. And actually, the, the last approach that I wanted to take is permissions boundaries. It was discussed in this room just a moment ago. Uh, so you know, between all, all of these, you, you'll, you'll have plenty of other sources to refer to. And in her talk, she, she defines the, the lowest complexity approach being, being IAM techniques using S3 prefixes, and the highest, highest complexity being this session broker pattern. Um, so, so we'll also ascend in complexity. 
uh, working towards uh, the, the, the most complex solution and describing why each one might be useful or unuseful for any given application. For plain IM, uh, the problem is, I, I, as I've alluded to a couple times already, it's just too slow moving. If, if I wanted to get one mutation per second into IM, that'd be 86,400 per day. The IM service is gonna rate limit me before I get anywhere close to that. The IM service is not built for this. It is built for, okay, I'm gonna change things once a month, not once a day. Not even, one, like, like it's, you're, you're gonna have a bad time if you're, if you're trying to get changes into IM that quickly. And they're, they're, actually, they're actually intending for you to have a bad time. They want the IM service to be uh, really available for you only, only when things about your application's inter uh, interaction with the world change, not your user's interaction with the world. Um, so the, the next thing I, like, I'd, I'd like to mention is like, there's also this, the, these limits on how much policy you can have. So in Becky's talk, she says you should fit about 30 prefixes in, S in an S3 bucket policy before you start saying, okay, I have a problem, I need to start looking at something else. Um, you also have uh, the availability of IAM policy on your roles. Um, those actually can go up pre uh, pretty large, but again, they, they, don't, they don't change very quickly. The next approach is permissions boundaries. I view these as a really good way to provide delegation between teams. So if I've got, say, an Elasticsearch cluster, and I, uh, I've got an Elasticsearch team that wants to spin up and spin down Elasticsearch clusters willy-nilly, like let's say they've got a test pipeline for it, they've, they've got, they just want, they, they want a very high degree of flexibility in spinning these up, I can draw a permissions boundary over the broadest set of permissions that any Elasticsearch cluster may have and say, okay, all of these are delegated down to that other team in my ecosystem they can make the decision about how to, how to divide things up between each, each Elasticsearch cluster. And what this allows is, especially for EC2 instance profiles, when, where you just have to use the role with no principal tagging, uh, you, you have the ability to uh, build a role that suits each uh, type of EC2 role or EC2 um, service. The next approach uh, is another really good way to to provide delegation. Uh, again, one team can uh, build, an, uh, build an S3 bucket with a rather granular, or sorry, a rather coarse policy. And, you, and then another team takes that coarse policy and applies a more granular policy by putting an S3 access point in front of it. So you have that, that delegation ability, plus you have the ability to uh, uh, multiply out the quantity of bucket policy you can apply. And that's just a numbers game because you can have 10,000 access points per account region. And if you, if you were, for instance, to take that to the extreme, you could, multiple, you could have you know, six kilobytes, I, yeah, I believe it's six kilobytes of access point policy uh, times 10,000 associated with any one, one S3 bucket. And the problem, the problem here is, is complexity. And then, and then the last thing that Becky also mentions in her talk is again, it's not dynamic. It's not designed to provide a high, high rate of change, which is again what we're trying to provide here. Let's build a proxy is by far the most powerful approach. And it's also the one that I think is the most dangerous and, I, and the one I, I definitely recommend not using. Uh, the reason it's powerful is because you can do anything with a proxy. You can make S3 look like any other service in the world. And that's great, but the problem is that you, you can't build it as scalably as S3 is gonna build it. S3 is, has a front door that is ready to send you terabits per second of data just in response to you asking it to. Um, and meanwhile, our proxy is probably not gonna be capable of doing that. If our proxy was scaled to be sending the, the, same, the same capacity that S3 can send, just in response to like a couple data lake jobs spinning up, then we would be burning a hole into our wallet trying to keep up with S3. Um, and then God forbid we, we like not use that capacity all the time, then we're, then we're just sitting there with idle capacity waiting for jobs that aren't coming. So the, the ultimate problem here is like, let's say, say I as a security team say I wanna build a proxy, I'm putting myself in the critical path of my data lake working at all. And when I'm in that critical path, I need to, to be just as good as the service I'm emulating, which is S3. There's no way I'm gonna achieve that. Amazon's got, got like, Amazon has more money than I do. I can't, I can't compete with them on this, on this axis, so I shouldn't try. 
And that's why we shouldn't build a proxy. The last approach, uh, again mentioned in Becky's talk, is STS assume role with a, with a broker. And what this does is you, you have a broker that has the permission to, say, read the, the broadest uh, part, the bit of my data, so a very, a very broad access to, to my bucket. And it also has some smarts to say which parts of the bucket should be accessible to each one of my workloads. Um, when it receives a request, somebody comes in and says, I'd like to actually access this prefix in the bucket, or I'd like to access that prefix in the bucket. It goes, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I will, I will use STS assume role to take my own credentials and assume a role uh, with a, with a inline policy that restricts those credentials. So the way a, a sum role works in this in this context is the the role might have a very broad set of permissions, and then when you pass the inline policy, you are explicitly intersecting the permissions in the role with the ones passed in this policy. So so your broker can make an, can synthesize a policy on the fly that will apply to the credentials that it, it generates. Once it calls STS assume role, it's going to pass those, those credentials that it got from assume role back to the original caller, and the original caller is then going to be able to access that prefix or prefixes in S3 that they requested. This is good because STS is a data plane service. Unlike IAM, so uh, unlike IAM, which is a control plane service, STS was meant as a data plane service. So it's designed to handle hundreds or thousands of requests per second. But there's still some major drawbacks that lead me to not want to use it in the general case. So, you know, in certain cases, yes, I would love to use it. But in the general case, probably not. Those are, number one, STS limits you to 2048 characters. The reason why it does, it has that limit, and that, this is a strict limit. I don't think it's one of those ones that you can just go to your account team and say, hey, could we raise this quota? The reason why is because when you pass it a policy, that gets encoded into the AWS session token that gets passed back to, your, to uh, you as your credential. And that credential must be passed every single time you make any request to AWS. So it'll be a lot of bytes over the, over the wire if you're trying to, to you know, put a very complex access policy into the inline policy. And that's why, that's why STS you know, went with a rather sensible limit of 2048. Um, it's really just meant to, to allow you to access one, two, three things, not n objects. If you're trying to go for an, an arbitrary or unbounded number of objects, that might, might, for instance, happen if I'm joining a lot of tables together in a data lake. Uh, this, isn't go this isn't gonna suit, and you're gonna actually have to just call STS many times. Again, exhausting that rate limit. So when, with, the, with the account wide rate limit, STS imp is going to impose some number that's probably not known to you, and probably not easily monitored by you, of uh, requests that you can send to STS before it'll just cut you off. You will be you'll be out out you know out cold um, with a data lake that doesn't work if you end up exhausting this this rate limit. So that sounds pretty scary, and it's probably not the the route that I would want to take. This brings us to to the the, the last solution, the the one that that provides you the most flexibility, but probably at the greatest level of complexity. So, what we realize here is that you know we took we took a look earlier. And we realized that we, we get to sign requests on an individualized basis. Like every request that gets, gets sent off by my AWS SDK is signed. And my SDK know has, how, knows how to do this signing. What if I taught a service on my network to do this signing? And here I have an example of that. So I've got, uh, I've got this curl uh, request that hopefully is visible to people probably about halfway through the room. And, and then the, the people in back will have to use the QR code. Um, so I've got this curl request. And we can see that I am logging in. I'm authenticating against my service with, with a really secure basic auth uh, username Josh, password is password. I'm requesting access to a given URL in S3. And I'm sending this off to localhost socket. Uh, what this does is it gives my signer an opportunity to look at this request and say, yeah, that looks good to me, or no, that doesn't look good to me. And my signer responded, so it's, it, it you know, responded with a non-trivial, responded with a 200 OK. And so it, it must have looked good for my signer. Um, but my signer did modify the request as it, as it went. So in addition to adding the date and authorization headers that are necessary for any request to get, to get authenticated to AWS, um, my signer also decided to uh, change the bucket being accessed. So it changed from permanent to permanent with a bunch of letters and numbers afterward. Um, it, cha it changed the region. 
because it knew where that bucket lived better than my app did. Uh, and it also changed the key. Uh, so, so this signer is added, providing some value added in, in a specific way that we'll get to in a moment. But the, the, the key is no different. And then finally, it, it imposed certain things that are, that are just best practices. Like it, it added the XAMZ expected bucket owner uh, header, which I see very rarely done by most applications, but is a good way to ensure that you're talking to the bucket you expect to talk to. Recall that, that buckets are a global namespace. So by default, you can just be talking to anyone's bucket unless you, you pass that header. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, the signer uh, modified the, the key being, being requested in S3. And here we can see uh, an example of how that works with a, a, real, a real user interaction. So what I've done here is I've shimmed the AWS, uh, AWS CLI, and I've given the AWS CLI the, the ability to expose a bucket, uh, one bucket as if it, as if it belongs uh, in total to each user that calls it. So I'm using the user environment variable here. First I export user equals Josh, and then uh, write, write the, the, just the, my, the uh, word Josh to a file called my name, upload that to S3, and then I do the same thing with a user called Alice, she uploads her own, her own name to S3. And, th and then when I skip the signer, so I, you know, I, I encoded an environment variable such that there's a way to skip the signer, uh, we can see that the, what the bucket actually contains is a separate key, one for Alice and one for Josh. And uh, as a result, whenever, whenever, you, whenever Alice calls the, the bucket, she sees her own, her own view of it. And whenever Josh calls the bucket, he sees his own view of it. I provisioned one bucket that can be used for any number of users, so long as they don't have slashes in their usernames, because I wouldn't want those keys to overlap. Um, and then the net effect is, is that I, I can uh, pro, you know, provide this as a service to, let's say, data lake jobs, where every single one of them might want to call S3 and store tempor temporary state, um, and, but not, none of them should be able to see each other. In case you're wondering how the AWS CLI plugin works, it's pretty simple. It fits on 36 lines, although the people in the back will have pro uh, an issue seeing the very bottom. Um, but at the very bottom, what's going on is that we, we, are, we are just uh, creating a hook that initializes with AWS CLI. Um, it, it, does, it skips the operation if we were told to skip signing. That we saw that on the previous slide. Um, but otherwise, it, it hooks this, this operation that already exists as, an, as a hookable uh, event hook in, the Bodo, in Bodocore where when Bodocore goes to choose how to sign a request, it has the option on, on a per service basis to override that signing operation. Um, so here, I've, so we're overriding that signing operation and then here's the implementation of that override. Um, all of this does is take the contents of my request, the contents of my proposed request, and ship it off via, the, via an HTTP call to, to localhost. And you can see I'm logging in with this hyper secure uh, basic auth method um, with, a, with a static password. But in real life, we would probably use like a JOT or an X509 certificate. And those credentials passed to the signer will become an essential part of my authorization decision. So the next question is like, okay, can I change responses? Like we, we, we demonstrated uploading data, we, we, we demonstrated downloading data, but like if I'm going to do a list call, then, then the list call is still going to reveal the fact that the data in this bucket is being prefixed by a user's username. It's not going to show what we want it to show, which is that, that, that it looks like the bucket belongs solely to a user. And the, the short answer is that without a proxy, we can't change a response. Recall we're really worried about proxies because they impose that performance bottleneck that we, that, uh, where we'd have to try to keep up with S3. But for lists, lists are not very performant. Like, like they're, not, they're not designed to send back billions of bytes in response to a 100-byte re request. So maybe we don't have to worry so much about proxy. And so that's what I've done here. Uh, here we can see that I do have a working implementation of AWS S3 LS. Josh sees you know, only his key. Alice sees only her key. They have different metadata because Alice's, Alice's name is one byte longer than Josh's. Um, you know, uh, in this case, Alice sees six bytes because Alice is five letters plus a line feed. And the way this is achieved is, is kind of stylized here on the right. Um, we can see that there's this, this list objects v2 call that gets sent off to the signer. And the signer goes, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. I, I'm in favor. 
So what I'll do is sign you a request that's actually going to come back to 127.0.0.1. Um, recall that's where the signer is living. Uh, so the signer says, hey, yeah, just send it to me. Um, and the client, the client is you know, none the wiser. It, it goes, sounds great, and sends the request off to the signer. The signer can respond with whatever it likes. It, it could, you know, it could, you know, respond in any language it likes. Uh, it doesn't have to be XML. Um, the client won't understand it if it's not XML, but the signer basically has complete control over the bytes returned. Um, and so the, the net effect is that my signer was able to intercept the request and change it. And so it became a partial signer, par partial proxy. So coming back to this previous slide, we have a big, you know, but we can do these things. Uh, we can proxy to ourselves. We saw that on the previous slide. We can proxy to an S3 object lambda. So S3 object lambda is designed as a way of, of rewriting the object contents itself. Let's say I have a need for some data redaction. Um, but they're costly. So like if I'm trying to do, you know, you know, thousands or millions of requests against an S3 object lambda, I'm going to pay for all of that. Well, an option with a signer is that, that the signer can selectively decide what, what uh, data needs to be redacted, send that to the object lambda, and send all the rest directly to S3. Um, and finally, we can send it like any other, any other HTTPS service. Uh, so that means that if I, have, if I want to accelerate certain operations, like the signer might have, might have a local cache of certain very popular configuration that otherwise lives in S3, uh, the, signer could, the signer can be like, oh yeah, let's, let's just send that to the local cache rather than, than sending it off to S3. So it turns out we have a lot of options for, for getting in the way of both the request and the response. Uh, here's the slide where, where I say, yeah, we've got all these means to, inter to interact with your, your data lake, and they all follow this one basic template. So the first thing you need to do is get your signer into your app shimmed in some way. So you know, for many Java-based frameworks, that's going to mean putting something on your class path in order to, uh, to provide this new, new behavior and to uh, get requests that are normally going to go through the normal uh, signing flow within your AWS SDK for Java to instead hit the signing flow that you're defining in this new jar that you're dropping on the class path. So that's going to that's gonna be thing number one. It's gonna, uh, thing number two is in the signer, you always have to have a means for authenticating the caller. If, we're, if the goal is to provide fine-grained authorization, we need a way to, to uh, understand who the caller is. Uh, so in my photo sharing example, it might be the cookie that the user logged in with, or the cookie that the user is known as. In uh, the data lake example, it's going to be like an X509 certificate that says, oh yeah, this is Josh's IPython notebook. Once we have that, we have to uh, take a look at whatever request is being, being, request, uh, being made and say, oh yeah, this, this is a request for, for this column within this table within the data lake. And we know that the attributes of this column are that it is, you know, it is, it is user's PII, but it's not material non-public information. And it looks like Josh's IPython notebook should be able to access that specific column within this specific table. With that knowledge, we can then you know, go, go on to step four and say, all right, yep, that's a good idea. Let's sign it. Or no, let's not. Let's, let's deny that authorization. Finally, uh, we, do, we do, a, do the signing operation. Again, that's the cryptographic hashing that we were discussing earlier. Once you've made all those, all those decisions, that cryptographic, cryptographic hashing is really simple. So the next question is like, OK, why are we talking about this solely in the context of S3? And the answer I have for that one is S3 is the only one where you really, really need to do this. For other ones, you might prefer just to proxy. Recall that I said earlier, like S3 stands ready to send you terabits of data at the, at the drop of a hat. That's usually not true of other AWS services. When I call EC2 and call run instances, it's going to send me a couple hundred bytes back. I don't need to worry about trying to, stay, trying to keep up with, with EC2, because you know, my proxy is just going to be more performant than whatever EC2 is going to do. So, you know, usually, in, 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 all, in all of the most exceptional cases, um, a proxy is a better idea for the other AWS services. Some of the exceptional cases that I've seen is like, you know, HashiCorp Vault authenticates using a signed, a signed request to STS get caller identity. So in that way, uh, the, the workload uh, signs that request for STS get caller identity, sends it off to Vault. 
Vault, uh, uh, and Vault goes, oh, okay, I'll issue that request. Um, and th whatever I get back must be uh, equal or must, be, must identify their credentials that were used to call me in the first place. Um, so that, that way Vault knows that you, you're authenticated with, with, with a set of AWS credentials without you needing to pass those credentials directly to Vault. The next question is, okay, well, we've demonstrated single part requests, but like, if you, if you know anything about S3, you know you might wanna do multi-part requests. You might wanna parallelize uh, accessing your data um, rather than just uh, calling a single, a single request to access a whole key. And the answer to that is yes, and in fact, it gets even better than yes because it turns one round trip to the signer into 20 potential, you know, actually an arbitrary number of potential multi-part requests because what you'll do is the, the, the signer will see the, the first request come in requesting part of the object, maybe the first 100 megabytes, and it says, okay, I'm gonna sign the first 20, 40, 50 requests for 100 megabytes a piece and send it back to the client just in case the client wants it in the future. The client, uh, you know, if, you're, if your shim understands how to do this, your, your, your shim will say, that's a great idea, I will cache these, and then when the, when the next request comes in for, a, for a, the next part of this object, Let's hope, you know, I'm, I'm asking for data 100 megabytes into this object. It's already in the cache, it's already ready to go. I don't even need to do another round trip to the signer in order to access that part of, of my data. Uh, the next question is, okay, well, how, how hard is this gonna be to operate? Can I like run it as a Lambda? The answer is certainly yes. Like uh, the, signer, the signer can operate over any protocol you like. It could operate over, you know, carrier pigeon if you so desire. Um, and a Lambda is, is a good choice for, for certain applications. But I think some people confuse that with like, okay, can I treat it like a managed service and, I, and like, you know, not really monitor it, not really scale it appropriately? The answer to that is no. Like you have to treat it uh, similarly to the uptime requirements of, of a proxy in your network because if the signer goes down or the signer gets overloaded or the, if the signer has a bad deploy, then whatever you're accessing behind the signer is also gonna go down. So you can't really treat it just like a managed service. And that, that leads to the next question of like, okay, do I have to worry about latency? The answer there is maybe, but not, might, not quite as much as you think. So if we break net latency down into three components, there's network latency. And in the example I gave earlier, I was talking over localhost. So you know, I don't have to worry about network latency. But I also have options like uh, you know, talking, making sure that my signer is in my local AZ, um, and and that, that's you know, designed to cut down on network latency. And when we think about S3, S3 is a service that's designed to send you back data over the course of maybe a second. So like S3 can be expected to send you back a, about 100 megabytes in a second. So I have some wiggle room. You know, I can add a millisecond here or there and, and, and probably not get, get in trouble. Uh, the, next, the next step in any, in any uh, journey is gonna be making that authorization decision. Should I have access to this thing? Your, your big solution there is caching. Uh, when you cache, you have the ability to, to say, okay, well, I, I know that, th that Josh's data lake job came to me before. Let me fetch all of the information about Josh's data lake jobs so that any future request that comes from the same job, I will already have cached. I'll already be able to make that decision in zero outbound network calls. And finally, uh, the signing operation itself some people think, okay, well, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do some cryptographic signatures. That's gonna take some time. But it turns out because this is symmetric cryptography using a hash, it's pretty straightforward. Like, like the, this, we can do billions of these per second. It's almost a non-entity, and I just put it on the slide to emphasize that it's, it's, not an emph it's not something we need to think about. Really think about the network, the network path and that authorization time. And, and if, you're, like, if you've got your network path down, I really just care about authorization time. So wrapping up, let's say I've got an S3 bucket that's in the wrong account. Like I'm, I'm, I'm on the tail end of an, an, S, an account migration. I've split every other resource. I've got my compute now running in this new account, but I've got this, this S3 bucket with, uh, with this use case that's still running in, the, in what, what I, I'm calling the wrong account. How do I get it into the right account? And the answer is that we can use a signer to do exactly that. We can shim uh, reads and writes to this bucket with a signer where the signer, the signer automatically rewrites every access to the old bucket to some new bucket. So uh, for writes, that's, that's just unconditional. Just write to the new bucket. For reads, it's see if the data is migrated yet. If the data has migrated, then send the read to the new bucket. If the data hasn't migrated, 
send it to the old bucket. And then you know, the, the, the data gets copied in the background. The thing that I really, really like about this is that it doesn't require the interaction of an application team past step one. They don't have to go write a migration batch. They don't have to write a migration verification batch. They don't have to do any of this stuff. We can leave this to experts like a data storage team or a security team or both in concert and, and then they can build a migration framework that could be used for one, 10, 100 services um, in, in following the same algorithm for each one. Last slide. This is my you know, data geekery coming in. And we can see that there are a bunch of features that S3 doesn't have. Like if you've ever said, I really wish I could rename something in S3, or I really, really wish I could move an entire prefix from you know, point A to point B in S3 you know, in one go. It's impossible. Like that's not something provided by the S3 API. But with a signer, you can emulate all this stuff. Like if you want to, if you want to get fancy, you can you can build a, an entire abstraction layer in front of your S3 bucket, and I find that really fun. So with that, thank you so much. Who has questions? Anyone have questions? My front-loaded questions were all answered, I think, so. Oh, no. <laughs> we can talk about more of the scream, more of that data perimeter issue. I, I thought about just coming up here and going, what? <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? Uh, so um, let's see what we got. I don't think there was any on Slack either. So if anyone wants to bail us out. All right. Yes. Um, in terms of trying to break up uh, S3 prefixes between users, like mm -hmm. I imagine that would get very heavy if you suddenly needed every tenant or unit user to upload with a different KMS key, or is there an elegant solution for that that I haven't thought of? Um, I, I think so. KMS keys can be influenced by the request headers, which is very nice because uh, you, your signer can say, "Okay, Josh's KMS key is this," and and throws that header into every request, every response that it gives to Josh. So I think this is actually one of those cases where signers will shine because you have that ability to, to influence every single request header. And I, I guess I didn't mention this, but when, you, when the, the signer puts in a header, the client of that signer, the client that receives the, the signed request on the other end, must send that header. It's not like the client gets an option of sending that header. You are now forced to send that header if you want your request to succeed. To like scope in a little bit further, yeah. My brain was getting stuck on like, where would the signer go to quickly look up a KMS key mm. with hundreds or thousands or millions of users? Yeah. So so that's uh, with that we we get back to kind of this slide where we talk about about caching. The answer is the signer. If the signer wants to be mm. quick, it's going to have to have a good cache of of everything it's planning to 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 use in order to authorize any given request. And in the case of your case, it would be like decorating the request after it's chosen to authorize it. Nice. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Anyone else? Awesome. Josh is around. So. Thank you. Yeah, I'm around. Thanks so much. We'll be back at 3.20. Uh, it is a break right now, hallway con time. So thank you, Josh.